Welcome metalheads. I got a fun bit of metal content for you this week because I wanted to do this interview a lot differently. Everybody does interviews on their podcasts and they all sound the same because they all ask the same questions. How did the pandemic affect the writing of this record? What gear did you use? Who engineered it? Where are you going on tour? All this stuff. And that's great, but I want it to be different. And besides, this is a philosophy podcast. So I asked these guys philosophy questions and this band was perfect for that. Horrendous. These guys are weird. And I told them that. I was like, you guys are weird. Your album sounds weird. Why are y'all so weird? And they opened up immediately and told me they answered some philosophy questions. And of course, we also talked about their new album that's coming out this Friday, August the 18th, Ontological Mysterium. You have to get it. I've heard it. It's amazing. It's weird. Just like these guys are. Check out the interview and you'll see what I'm talking about. All right. The band Horrendous. Welcome to Heavy Metal Philosophy. Going on. Yeah, thank you. This is, as I was telling you guys before we started recording, my first time having the whole band on the podcast, so this should be interesting. Now, I want to ask y'all some questions about the record that you have coming out on the 18th. But before we do that, this is a not only a metal channel, but also a philosophical channel. So I want to ask you a philosophical oh. question to get us going, and then we'll we'll talk about the album. I like that. That sounds great. All right. So I've asked many people this same question, and I, I like to ask this question because I always get a different answer, and it's always interesting how people feel about it. So simply, do you believe in free will or determinism? <laughs> wonder who's going to take a stab first. Go ahead, buddy. I know you're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very difficult one to answer, actually. Indeed. Yeah. Um, that's uh, We could spend the entire podcast thinking about this. Um, I spent my whole life <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> I I think my, my take on this is that, like, I'm a synthesis person and that, like, because we can conceive of free will and because we can conceive of determinism, that there are variable strains of these like forces on our lives. Like it, when it comes to belief, I don't believe in, I don't believe in like purely either because like they are, they are concepts that are divided from like the functioning of, of, of things. Like they are, they're, they're philosophical concepts that are, that are, that were built and have been developed on so that we can like understand behavior and like, and different interactions in the world. So like, I, but like yeah so like i reject both in a in a <laughs> funny way i love that. um and i like i think that like i know part of me thinks that there is a a, a set fate um and any time that but i'm also a person who loves to toy with thinking about the idea of fate or thinking about you know like things that were destined to be but not out of a belief that i think that it actually exists it's sort of like a it's kind of like a poetic exercise and free will the same way like i i want i believe in like autonomy for like thinking beings or i think i think i believe in autonomy for like all kinds of beings regardless of like a hierarchy of level of thought or cognition or whatever but at the same time like we're organic creatures with things that with men who deal with many things that are outside of our control so like i i like it's it's hard for me to embrace free will as like a as just like some kind of like ultimate existing thing either like i think that that it's limited its power is limited so that's my answer i will uh i like you can surely comment on that first before i, I start speaking if you would like <laughs> if you prefer and just to add some Go context to the question um the reason why I started thinking differently about free will versus determinism is actually because of metal itself. Yeah, huh. I, I was always a free will guy. You know, I pick my cereal at the grocery store. Obviously, I have free will. But when I remember back to the first time I heard a metal riff, I had no choice in the matter. There was no deliberation. It was instantaneous. My life was changed forever. Now I'm a metalhead. You know, I'd like to think that I chose, but I didn't. And when I look back on it, I realize like, no, nope, that was it. I, I remember distinctly going, oh, I'm in trouble now. 
because I came from a a fundamentalist Christian family and I knew that this was going to cause me problems. You know, the smart thing would have been to be like, well, no, I'm just not going to do this. But again, I had no choice. I was predisposed already to be a metalhead. Mm. Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a, it's a great concept. That's funny. So I, I, my brother and I, Jamie in the, in the bottom corner there grew up Catholic. And I remember going to guitar lessons, like before I was into metal, actually, like in my little Catholic school uniform, be like straight after school. I think it was in sixth grade. And my guitar teacher was this like <clears throat> really wild kind of like motorcycle guy uh, who happened to love Black Label Society and Zach Wild. So also a Catholic. Like, uh, oh, is he? I, I didn't know. I believe it though. Um, <clears throat> and he's actually the guy that kind of turned me on to metal like i was bringing in a bunch of punk stuff that we were into and i remember him i think he just like one day in the middle of learning a song it must have been kid dynamite or something he just pulled his guitar out and was like we can keep learning stuff like this if you if you want or and then he like played this ridiculous solo he's like or we can do stuff like this and i was of course just like yeah i want to do that now <laughs> so he i remember he gave me a list of records to buy to like listen to start listening to metal and like peace of mind was at the top i think like rust in peace was on there too but i don't i don't think i got that until later but i peace of mind was like the first metal record i actually bought and like had as a kid so so yeah i guess in a, in a way i didn't choose it either it was it was kind of thrown at me right and and in those circumstances you just laid out you know you happened to have that guitar teacher and then you happened to be disposed to like the music. You know, he could have offered you that and you, and you could have been turned off by it. Like most people are, you know, most people aren't into metal, but for some reason we are. I would like to believe that there's an insanely high correlation between those from like fairly religious households and heavy metal too, though, especially like Christian households. Mm -hmm. So I think metal is such this, lovely location of iconoclasm for that Indeed. and just think other ways of thinking i think even like a lot of people who get into metal who were from predominantly christian families mm -hmm. um even if the music doesn't like change your belief system or your mind i think at the very least it gets you to interrogate those thoughts more and i think there's something especially when you're young it's kind of like the ultimate taboo it's like oh my god they're talking about the devil like holy right. shit there's like some stuff I, I was afraid to even listen to when I was starting out, right? like deicide right. covers or something. I'd be like, oh, my God, Christ right, is I, dead. I dipped my toes in the water with Metallica, but it took me a while to work up the courage to listen to a Cannibal Corpse record, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I, I think I wouldn't be shocked if like an obscene percentage of, of metalheads are grew up in Christian households. Yeah, would, would the rest of you agree? Damien, Mr. Knox? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would. I, I did not grow up in a religious household, but by the same token, um, I I always felt the the presence of religion just in, in society uh, in right, general. Right. And so I, I still felt that uh, that need for rebellion, um, regardless of my my direct circumstances. But yeah, especially in the U.S., right? Yeah. The U.S. is pretty rampant. Right. It so like you say, you didn't grow up in a religious household, but you definitely, you know, we're taught that it's a secular society, but in practice, it's it's really not. You know, this is a country that was founded by Puritans, and a lot of that has carried over. So there's definitely the way it was structured. You still feel the weight of that history. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But uh, by the same token, I I was not scared to to dive into the deep end. <laughs> so, Great man. I I just went all you wanted it, baby. <laughs> it was easier for me to finally admit to myself that I didn't believe in Noah's Ark. That that story is fucking ridiculous, and I don't believe it. It was easier for me to finally admit that to myself than it was for me to get over that fear of Cannibal Corpse. Like it, it took me a couple of years later before I was like, man, why am I not listening to this? <laughs> and then when I did, I was pissed. I was like, why wasn't I listening to this? <laughs> True confession. I just, I started liking them like for real, probably five years ago. 
Yeah. It's, it's, it was always like do them. I was like, yeah, Hammer Smash Face is great, but five years. I think it was actually during the pandemic. Even I was just like, actually bought some of the first presses of like the the Chris Barnes ones. I was like, holy shit, this stuff is absolutely disgusting. This is wild. And today, the recording of this is the ninth. They just dropped a new video today. It's like those guys are still oh, yeah. sick. Like, how are you? How are y'all still sick? We're yeah, not here to talk him. about cannibals. We're here to talk about you guys. So let's uh, <laughs> let's talk about the album, Ontological Mysterium. I I love that album title, the mystery of being. So speaking of metal and philosophy, I had on like not a blue collar philosopher like me, but a, a real like academic philosopher he's, he's studying his phd in metal studies speaking of me being pissed off when i find out about something but his uh phd thesis that he's writing is basically that all metal is an exercise in existentialism mm. but w when i read that theory i thought it was like ah so let me just go ahead and say he ruined my show i had these grand plans for my show <laughs> And I was like, I'm going to talk about all these different philosophical, you know, compare them to the different bands. I'm going to go in all these different directions. And he's like, well, all metal is existentialism. I'm like, no, it's not. I'm going to debate this guy. And I did all this reading. And the more I read his stuff, I was like, damn, he's right. <laughs> so now what do I do? But anyway, that is a lifetime proving him wrong now. Yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long battle. So with, with that being said, you know, a lot of what we're talking about with that being an exercise and existential, a lot of it's like steeped in, you know, metaphor, like death metal is all about like, you know, zombies killing people gorily. But like, this is like right on the nose, the mystery of being like, you, you guys aren't, it's just right away. It's like, this is weird. Y'all It's like, you don't, you're not steeping it in metaphor. You're not skirting around it. You're just like, yo, existence is weird is that like intentional or have you been building up to this i'd say maybe in a way i think our lyrics really since our first record have been have been moving in the more philosophical direction um and even when we are doing more using more kind of like classical metal imagery and things like that like it, it almost always is and has been for us since like ectasis i would say for the most part more of a philosophical exercise and like using the the toolkit and, and the the lexicon i guess of heavy metal music but using it to to try to communicate some other ideas and explore some other ideas so in a way i think we've been building up to this and i, I don't know if i would say the lyrics are like more or less philosophical on this record than before than like the last record for example maybe maybe stuff before that but it's for sure I've always kind of been like a mission of ours to to do that and to have the lyrics be something that is are as complex as the music and something that you can really sit with and think about that that like matches the movement and the complexity of the the music that we're making so a work in progress perhaps it's been well speaking of the complexity of the music i would very kindly like to describe it as weird the, I, I listened to this yeah. album and I was like, wow, this is really different, really different. Like, I mean, I interview bands all the time and, 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 you know, they say, well, we don't want to be labeled. And I'm like, yeah, but you're death metal. That's what you sound like. But it, it really would be uh, misleading to call you guys a death metal band. Like there's a lot of like trad metal on this. There's like, jazzy stuff but you're not doing it in like a progressive avant-garde sort of way it just it, it sounds to me like like are you guys um does novelty turn you on like in your normal everyday lives <laughs> for sure me for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah novel experiences yeah i love that you said that though. I, I think i i for one am really glad that the the tag death metal seems inadequate to you so i think that we've felt that way for a while now um, and it's not something we like want to outrun or escape because like for sure the basic tools of what we're using are death metal and that's that's where this all came from um and i think 
in a way became maybe the the dominant voice and maybe the easiest voice for us to use in in the catalog of like metal possibility i guess and i think that's why it is at its root a death metal band it's like something that we could all do from the start and everything since then has been this means of expanding that to to include more while never really leaving that arena and i, I, I of course like the history of the roots are still there but i do agree that we're playing in, in a different world at this point, in a different place. And what it is, I don't, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. And people ask us to describe it sometimes, and it is, it's pretty fucking hard to do. Yeah. To give like a, something that gives a full picture of what, especially on this record, like what is on this record and and how it all works, like you said. And I, th- I think some of the feelings of the avant-garde that I get from other bands is like, in a way, just a shorter, a shortcut for saying like they they jammed a bunch of stuff together that isn't related and it sounds weird. Whereas I think our process has always been how do we take these things that are different or that are outside of the genre and make them work in the genre to so, to the point where like people may not even realize what it is or like that we borrowed a rhythm from from some genre that's that's worlds away from heavy metal. And I think a lot of times people don't even know, and that's kind of the key. It's like, how do we, how do we expand the language of metal music um, without playing into that cheap, like, I'm going to throw this part in here, and it sounds like jazz, and then the song suddenly sounds like jazz or something, you know, or like, could be anything. Yeah, it's not weird for the sake of being weird, but that's why I asked you, like, are y'all turned on by novelty in your everyday lives? So... Picture this, all right? Yeah. Lots of people from lots of different walks of life love metal. You know, you got lawyers and and accountants and all kinds of people, and, and they pick up a guitar and they've got riffs. Like, you know, they love metal and they can make good death metal. But it's it it feels to me like you guys have to be out in the world like looking for the novelty in life to make this kind of music. It's not just like, you know, a uh, I'm an engineer in my day job, you know, so I'm not, I'm not downplaying these white collar jobs. I'm just saying, you know, that, that I don't want to say basic cause I love basic extreme metal, you know, but it's just, there's a, there's a feeling that I get when I listen to this horrendous album. Like, man, like these guys are looking at mundane things and picking things out of them. Hmm. Really interesting. I feel that. I mean, I identify with that deeply. Like, I've always seen the band as like a vehicle for like a distillation process, right? Like, you can do it in two ways. You can throw everything like into a container and let it sort of just like mix up, or you can like throw all of those things in sort of like a specialized machine that like, you know, like I'm thinking about this old those old devices that they used to make alcohol, where it's like these like containers, and then like the alcohol like distills and it comes out sort of like drip by drip and like a different it like goes to the other side or something I, I can't remember exactly what they're called but like you know it's a slow process and it like takes time and you're not, you're just getting like a little bit of time a little bit of time but then you get this like special spirit on the other side and i feel like that's our writing processes are like that you know like we're trying really hard to like synthesize and not just again like not just for the sake of it i think it has to be it, it has to be meticulous and like we want to feel that we want to feel like when we listen to the songs we want to feel that kind of like thing that you're describing right that like we, that we've like managed to get to we've like managed to pick some special things and put them together as opposed to just like a riff or just like a part that does something weird you know so i don't know it's it's refreshing to hear that you know that's the kind of the hope is that we sure. will do that <laughs> I, so I also oh yeah yeah go for it go for it does it take a long time the writing process since you describe it that way? I would say so. For sure. I, I think compared to other bands, that just like objectively, yes. Yeah. I feel like <laughs> based on what I'm the way that I'm seeing other people work, and not that I have like a ton of examples, but like we really do take our time. And Damien, uh, being the engineer also for the music, like this means that we have the writing. The writing process is essentially through the entire way. Like all, all the way to like, I feel like even in the mixing process, there's like the question of like, maybe we should really add this extra touch here at this place. And this is like years and years into the process. Right. <laughs> you know, like, so I think generally we're a slow, a slow burn. 
Um, although that hasn't always been true in the past with them, but Actisus and, and Anaretta were not super far apart, but, you know, different yes. times these days. Yes. Youth, youthful, youthful energy in infinite time. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, it is funny. It's like, I, I do think where sometimes in, there's cases where we're like, still writing up to the point where it's like the record submitted like we have to stop it's like <laughs> the day before we submit the record to the label there's like still like oh maybe we could do this you know <laughs> which is fun also kind of a curse because we have the time and we can't ever just like walk away from it i think yeah it's hard to walk away from it. it's hard to feel like this is completely done i i don't want to change anything about it and i i think in a way, the deadline is like the thing that makes that happen. Whereas other bands, it's like you have two weeks in the studio or less, a lot of times one week, and you do what you can do and that's it. And then, then it's game over, right? And that's It was never that way with us since we have Damien. It sounds like you guys are a band that benefits from having a deadline as much as it must be annoying. We do, for sure. As, as long as that deadline is deep in the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so then we have some given a deadline, so yeah, we have to like self impose it, which is pretty hard. Yeah. Well, and then the deadline is far away enough that we we don't work too hard on it right away. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a a lofty distant deadline for the real crunch time. Comes in. A little bit of healthy pressure, <laughs> self imposed. Well, uh, back to the record, I, I described it earlier. Not only as weird, but I hear a lot of traditional heavy metal on this one. Is is that like, are you guys all just big fans of that OG metal, or did it was that like a conscious decision? Like, hey, we want to put a lot of trad metal on this album. Your honesty from everyone's from everyone's part. I, for one, yes, I'm a huge traditional metal fan. I'll let the I'll let the other boys chime in here. Yeah, I mean, I think most of us are at least. Um, maybe some more than others, but I don't think anyone doesn't enjoy that stuff, <clears throat> truthfully. Yeah, and I think also there was a focus on on making the songs, like, fun this time around. And I think having, like, you know, high-flying, memorable, like, solos is, like, sort of part of that um, part of that tradition. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's something that, you know, we incorporate. I think for me too, I was going to say, um, a lot of it to me has to do with the spirit of that music more than, more so than the sound. And I think for sure, there's a lot of like actual traditional metal sounds on the record too, but, uh, overall to me, it's the spirit that I think we're after. It's like this ecstatic, uh, joyousness, maybe, um, this feeling of like strength, I don't know, yeah, um, yeah. strength of the spirit perhaps. And I think one one thing I always think about when when I am considering our band in relation to like traditional metal bands is is particularly like our use of melody. Because a lot of times in death metal bands, it's more like melodic death metal, where to me the melody is used to kind of evoke this like sorrow or like melancholy or something. And I feel like most of the time the melodies for us are like these points of uh, ecstaticism and like a fever pitch spiritual moment for you as a listener, as opposed to like I'm not I don't want you to feel like sad or mournful usually at these melodies it's like it's this moment usually amidst some chaotic moment in the record of like release and, and true catharsis and a soaring thing and i, and I think that is, is heavily informed by those traditional metal bands because that is really what they were doing to me anyway that's like it's funny just thinking a lot about um the other day i, he I heard stand up and shout like in the car and was thinking about like you know, we've been having a lot of conversations recently about the record, so we've had the space to think more and more. And I was just like, you know, like that song is like an anthem for you to like believe in yourself that like, like you are the driver, you fucking own the road, you know, like all these different things. And like a lot of the points on the record, the lyrically, even like uh, musically, lyrically, I would even say rhythmically for me on the new record, that like kind of has to me like, like is in the spiritual lineage of, of that kind of like, vibe you know and like not like a direct steal like not necessarily like it's, it can never be precisely like a do track or something right it's just because it is just a different world at the end of the day but i do think a lot of us 
feel a deep connection to that. And I also owe, I, I, I'd like to just like say transparently to like growing up, I liked a lot of thrash. I liked a lot of like m mellow death. I liked a lot of like jazzy metal and stuff, but like I missed a lot of like traditional heavy metal. Like, of course I heard it cause it was just around. And I like, I was hanging out with my friends who listened to metal. Sure. I didn't have, it was actually hanging out with Jamie and Matt and, and uh, Nick Duchemin from the silver to like, uh where i like learned as like an adult that like i that like to really really love like traditional heavy metal and it, like changed my life as a metal head i feel like i just realized that like so much of what i love about metal is distilled perfectly in like judas priest dio iron maiden like all these things and so like yeah and i'm and i can see as an outsider too that i feel like after idol and and that like and exploring a lot of new territory that there was like a little bit of a desire to bring some of that into the music. Um, and I think, and I think it shows up on the record and I think it's super fun. Yeah. So you guys, this record is great for anybody listening. A metalhead is like me. I, I, I tend to gravitate towards metal. That's more on the brutal side, like uh, progressive sounding stuff. And what I, what always kind of kept me away from the trad metal was the more operatic side, but you described it as like strength. And that's what it does have. It has like strength and bombast and energy. So this record has all of that. It has the strength, the bombast, the energy, the excitement, but then it still has like that modern edge to it. So it, it doesn't have like that power metals. It doesn't sound dated at all. It's just, I can hear those influences in there. I love that. And I, it's funny Alex mentioned the, the Dio song, because I do think in a way, a lot of the message of the record is is that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, of course, from this from this new place of like maturity, not just at us as people, but I think the genre, like as a genre and as a whole, and the the age that it's that it's acquired i think and maybe the wisdom that it's acquired um where when dio was singing that in 1982 or three whenever that record came out um like he meant every word and i i think hearing it if, if you're someone who didn't grow up with that and you're hearing it now and you're looking back it's like who the fuck is this guy like this guy's a clown what is this dude no <laughs> i i think people forget that 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 wasn't a joke you know that wasn't cheese that wasn't uh it wasn't any of that like to me when i see him when i see him play or you watch old videos and this dude's like an actual magician he's a wizard <laughs> and like i don't see anybody like that nowadays like anybody in any fucking new band nobody had that power and i just think it's easy to, to look back on those times and forget just like if you're watching an old fucking movie and, and people are talking in like these stilted old-fashioned ways or god these motherfuckers so dumb or whatever they're insincere um but it's just it's just how he communicated it and it was real and i think if anything the record is just like a much a much more mature and sophisticated maybe i don't know if that's the right word uh means of, of communicating that same message but I, I think it's the same the same fire that we've tried to take from then to now um and that is why honestly speaking there aren't many like traditional metal revival bands that I think are that good. And I think it's because they're looking at this thing on the surface and it's like, we're going to copy what the stuff was on the surface. And that's all they're communicating is like the things that don't make sense in our current yeah. world because yeah. they can't make sense in our current. And I think that, that to me is the record's great success and the band success, which is really what we've been doing for many years now. And, and I just think we, we managed to do it in a way that, we, I don't want to say we perfected it yet, but I think we're working towards that, but carrying that same flame that they had and bringing it into, into a space that actually makes sense with where we live right now. That movie analogy you made makes a lot of sense. So for instance, if somebody today was to try to speak like Dean Martin, it would sound yeah. fake, <laughs> yeah. you know? but that's who Dean Martin actually was. Yeah. So if you wanted to make movies like that, you couldn't speak like Dean Martin, but but you would want to still have that coolness that he had if you wanted to make that kind of movie. Yeah, and who who is the modern Dean Martin? Who's the cool talker? I don't I don't know, but we have them. But that I think that would be the analogy. 
who's the, the, the coolest talker of our day. Yeah. Which I'm, I'm too far behind the times to really know at this point. But. <laughs> well, I've only got a couple more questions for you. One of the ones as a guitar player I really wanted to ask was like, all of these riffs sound very different. There's not very, there's no like similar riffs on the record. So I was wondering, is that a, is that a product of the writing process taking so long or do you guys just like hear a riff when you're writing and go, that sounds like this riff, throw it out. <laughs> Any takers. Yeah, we've been talking. I know. I've been, I've been yeah, take us, take us sucking up the air here. <laughs> you can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess my perspective on that. I've, I have always just, I think as a band, we've always collectively just wanted to do new things. As you said, this this like being a sucker for novelty and maybe thrilled by novelty. And I do actually have that that exact like process in my mind. It's like, does this riff sound too similar to what we've done already? And or as a song. And if it if it does sound similar to something else, at least I hope that's not the focus of this song. You know, it's like, all right, we slipped this one in here that's kind of like this song from two records ago, but that's not really the purpose of the song existing. It's like mm -hmm. this other thing and it's a bridge to this other thing. And I think um, to me, always having some type of core idea or like philosophical nugget music in, in each song that one writes that is different and that does bring something new to the table. Uh, I, just for me, it's like, what else, what is the point if you don't have that? And I, I seem to recall, this is a funny, this is a funny like recollection here, but the guy from Children of Bodom, Alexi Laiho or something, I remember him saying something like that in a magazine, like, when I was 12, probably. And I have a funny feeling that that might be the thing that, that like, yeah. stuck with me, where he's just like, every song has this at least one big moment that is unlike every other big moment in our songs. And like, that is the attraction or like the, the reason for coming, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I think our band has just, in its own way, done something like that. But we, the new record in particular, I think we, we've done that to a different degree because we, we truly did like focus on one idea and see where that one idea led and each song really grew into its own like personality and, and thing um, while still somehow maintaining a cohesiveness with everything else. Yeah. I think yeah, everyone's man. like really bad, please. Uh, the cohesiveness to me comes from the novelty of it. It's a, it's a constant move from one thing to the next. Like, the only thing that kind of uh it's like oh whoa that was that that what I, I don't know what happened there is the aurora neo tesseric and 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 the <laughs> thing with that one was is just it was so short i was like i want more why did it stop <laughs> i feel that way too when i hear that trick <laughs> just a tease yeah i i will say too i think like everyone's really sensitive to sort of like you know like sometimes the easy way out when you're trying to like get an idea to progress is sort of to like you know, like use what you already have, uh, but like copy in a copy paste kind of way. And that can be really helpful. I feel like we actually, we, there's, I think there's a little bit more repetition on this record than maybe the last one, like, in, and intentionally so, but there's also this other thing where it's like, if you listen really closely to some of these songs, you'll notice that like some of the parts that feel like, oh, that's a new part and it doesn't sound anything like the last one, but there's like elements borrowed from stuff that's already happened. It's kind of like a compositional trick, right? Where it's sort of like, maybe like a, little flourish from uh the previous riff is actually like used as the kernel to build the next section or it's like Motif. a yeah exactly and there's a lot of motivic things and i i, I sometimes I, I hope that people can hear those things when it sounds like things are like have gone off the rails like a lot of the times like we're really thinking about what little things can we bake into the formula that kind of give this relation to the things around it you know um and it's really fun it's like a fun game to play and i actually think that like everyone in the band is really good at it and it's uh uh, just like that is like an enjoyable puzzle to figure out. Excellent. Well, I hate to end the interview, but I don't pay for Zoom, so I have a limited amount of time. I feel like I could talk to you guys all day, but the record is Ontological Mysterium out August the 18th on Seasons of Miss. Good luck with the release, guys. I'll put all of your information in the description. Thank you so much for joining me on Heavy Metal Philosophy. Thanks for having us. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks.